Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Brian, and I love fire. <laughs> Ever since I was a little boy, I don't know what it is. I think a lot of little boys kind of grow up loving fire. I know I see a, a few people nodding their heads in agreement. It was Brother Dewey Horton's mask back there that kind of, kind of sparked, no pun intended, a little bit of, of imagination in me. He's got a fire mask, in case you haven't seen it yet. I love fire. I love sitting around a fire. I love the conversations that happen when people gather around a fire. I love watching the fire dance and, and feeding the fire and tending to the fire. And, and if you know anything about fires, you know that fires are very fussy. They need a lot. They need fuel. They need oxygen. And oftentimes, if you're sitting around and tending a fire, you have to feed a fire pretty regularly to keep it going. If, if you don't, the fire can tend to just dwindle and fade until it goes out. And I don't think there's any surprise that the Bible uses the picture of fire in a lot of different ways. The Bible talks about fire in terms of its negative properties, certainly. The lake of fire, the eternal fire, and that should spark within us, again, no pun intended, fear. To spend eternity in fire, to spend eternity with a fire that never ends, that's a, that's a frightening situation. But the Bible also talks about fire in terms of zeal and passion and our enthusiasm and our, our vigor and excitement. What happens, though, sometimes is rather than fanning the flames, we pull out the fire extinguisher. And when we get excited about the Lord, when we get excited about the Lord's work and doing more and growing, sometimes we find ourselves, rather than tending to the flame, we put it out. Whether we intend to or not, whether we realize it or not, we pull out the spiritual fire extinguisher and snuff out the fire. It reminds me of Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Not a surprise to anyone here. I think we've all read this verse plenty of times, but 1 Timothy, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul's talking to Timothy in a very personal way, says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Paul's encouraging Timothy with exactly what we need to do with our faith, with our excitement, with our zeal and our fervor for the Lord. There's all kinds of words we could use. But compare it to a fire. Fan the flame of faith within you. When I stop and think about some of these fire extinguishers that we use, to snuff out the flame, it's unfortunate. Because God wants us to fan the flame of faith within us. He wants us to grow in our excitement, in our passion for Him. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm or even cold, as Jesus talks to the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3. I'd rather you be hot. And he does say, I'd rather you be cold, hot or cold, just make a decision. Instead, you're lukewarm. And that's what happens so often. And I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of this this morning. Because here we are, and Chris talked about it a couple weeks ago. Here we are at the beginning of a new year. And this is, for better or for worse, this is the time where a lot of people are thinking about where they want to be in a year and the goals that they want to have. And particularly for us at Monta Vista today is the day where we sit and think about the goals that we have as a congregation. We're going to hear in just a little bit our elders talk about the goals for Monta Vista in 2021. And I know if, if you're like me, you get done with a presentation like, like we're going to see today, and you probably find yourself pretty excited about the things that are happening, hopefully. Hopefully you find yourself excited about the things that, that we have planned, the things that we want to accomplish together in this church for the Lord this year. Does that excitement continue a week from now? Does it, does it continue a month from now? You know, looking back a year ago, there were a lot of things from that presentation in January that could have extinguished our flame, and maybe they did for you. 
Maybe you found yourself struggling with some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning. Maybe you weren't as excited about the things that we wanted to accomplish. Because I guarantee you, as you look at that board, a lot of that stuff didn't happen. <laughs> a lot of that stuff, and rightly so, a lot of that stuff we didn't get to because of circumstances beyond our control. But are you excited about the things that we're going to do this year? Are you excited about the vision that our elders are going to lay out? And you're going to keep that excitement going throughout the year and push through whatever challenges might come our way. I'm excited. But sometimes we pull out the fire extinguisher and we snuff out the flame. And so I want to talk about four things that we can do to snuff out the flame of our faith to snuff out our zeal, to, to extinguish that flame within us. And I want to pull from the instructions that you'll see on basically every fire extinguisher. How do you use a fire extinguisher, by the way? Well, just remember the acronym PASS. Very simple. Pull the pin, aim the nozzle at the fire, squeeze the handle, and sweep side to side. That's the simple reminder. If you get nothing else out of this lesson, hopefully you know how to use a fire extinguisher at the end of it all. <laughs> so there's that. What we're going to do is, is use this acronym PASS to talk about four things that we can do in our spiritual life that snuff out our excitement and our zeal for the Lord. Unfortunately so. And maybe you do these things. I have absolutely done every one of these things. And so let's talk about these things together. The first, maybe we will pull the pin of presumption. We pull the pin of presumption. That's where it starts so often. Presumption is an attack on truth. It's an attack on our beliefs. And here's what it often sounds like. Maybe you've said these words. I'm sure I know all that I need to know. I know enough. I know what I need to know. I don't need to I don't need to learn anything more. I don't need to dig any deeper. I don't need to investigate in the scriptures anymore. Maybe this is what you say when you're thinking about a yearly Bible reading plan. I don't need to read the Bible. I've read, look, I've read the New Testament before. I don't need to read it again. Maybe that's what you, maybe that's what you think about when you get into the study of Revelation. I don't need to read the book of Revelation. It's, it's, I've, I've read it before. It's just complicated. I don't want to read it again. And by the way, we're going to be studying the book of Revelation in our Bible classes for a very long time this year, so I hope you don't presume to know everything about the book of Revelation. You see, what happens is so often we come to the Bible, we come to our study, and we think we know the answer. We think we know what, what there is to know, and, and maybe we just scratch the surface Maybe we, we glance off like a rock skipping on a smooth lake. We kind of glance off of our, of our study, and we don't dig in. We don't get deep. We don't get personal. We don't allow the Word of God to transform us, and we presume to know what the Bible has to say without actually looking at it. And when we do that, you are not going to be on fire for the Lord. You are not going to be fanning the flame of faith within you when you presume to know what the Bible has to say. And with all of these, I want to start by, by looking at Jesus, because Jesus is the ultimate example of this. And would it be surprising to you that Jesus himself learned? So often we view Jesus, and rightly so, I think, as, as God in human form, God who knows everything, who created everything. Yet, would it surprise you to know that even Jesus himself learned? Surely you can go back to his 12-year-old self in the temple as he's there having spiritual conversations about the law of God and about, about God's plan and, and those kinds of things as he was learning and growing. But here in Hebrews, the Hebrew writer says in chapter 5, verse 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. This is a, a throwback to Jesus in the garden. He's, he's crying out to the Lord and praying if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. And then the Hebrew writer says in verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. 
Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, had to learn something on this earth. And I'm not going to presume to understand how that all works. I don't know how it works. But I believe what the Hebrew writer is saying. That Jesus had to learn something. He, he did not know fully what it was like to be a man, to be us, to be in the situation that we are in from day to day. He did not know what that was like. And so he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He became the perfect high priest, the perfect mediator between God and man because he came to this earth, he suffered like we do, yet without sin. And now he can go between us and God. He learned from his suffering. And I think that just tells us that if Jesus came here to learn, we need to stay curious about God's word too. We need to have a, we need to have a mindset of curiosity. We need to have a mindset that whenever we go to the word of God, yes, though we may have read it dozens of times before, any mature Christian that I've ever met has told me that every time they go back to the Word, they learn something more. They learn something more. And it, it's a, it's a never-ending process. The well of God's Word is deep. It's deep and it's rich. And every time we go to God's Word, we can, like the Bereans, study daily, check daily to make sure the things that we're hearing are true, searching the Scriptures to make sure that all the things that we're hearing from this pulpit the things that we're hearing from our friends, the things that our elders are teaching us as well, that all these things are true and accurate, staying curious about the Word of God, understanding how it applies to my day-to-day -day life. As we, as we presume to know things, though, we can very easily snuff out the flame of our faith when we're unwilling to learn, when we stop being curious about God's Word. So, maybe my encouragement to you is stay curious Go to the Word. Be in the Word. Like the psalmist says in Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3, like a tree that's planted by the rivers, that's roots are just soaked in the waters. That's what we should be doing in our meditation and constant thought over God's Word. That's, that's who we are as people. That's, that's how we can keep excited and keep the, the flame of our faith going for the Lord. But maybe we'll... Take aim with anxiety. It's the second one. Maybe we'll take aim with anxiety. And this is an attack on our heart, on our values, on our inner man, who we are inside. Anxiety can, can so easily take us down, can so easily extinguish the flame of our faith. And maybe it sounds like this. I'm afraid of what might happen. I, anybody said that in 2020? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of us did. Maybe you're still saying that. And don't get me wrong, fear is good. Fear is the thing that, while I'm standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, keeps me from taking a one step forward. Fear, fear is not bad, it's not, it's not negative, but an overabundance of fear, taking fear too far, is where, where the problem really sets in where we're gripped with fear, when we're, we're immobilized by fear, when fear just takes over and, and we don't act, we don't, we don't take a step forward for the Lord. Anxiety can seriously dampen our relationship with the Lord. And going back to Jesus, we find here that Jesus defeated fear with love. Jesus was worried about going to the cross. And you see that in his prayers to the Father there in the garden in Matthew, you see his, his concern, you see the anguish that he was going through. Yet as we talked about, he said, not as I will, yours be done. He defeated the fear of going to the cross with the love that he had not only for God, but also for the Father. He took action for the Lord. He took action for us going to that cross for us. And in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 
We love because he first loved us. We love, we know love because he first loved us. And backing up to verse 17, by this love is perfected with us so that we have confidence for the day of judgment. We have confidence. We can be, we can be assured that heaven is ours. No matter what this life brings us, no matter what troubles we go through, no matter what fearful things we may have to deal with in this life, we can be confident that the Lord loves us. Because he died for us. Because he left that garden, the place where he was worried and concerned about what was going to happen next, and he went to the cross for you and me. Because he loved us. And when I'm gripped with anxiety, I forget my true focus. Worry clouds my true focus. And look, if you're in the middle of having anxiety, if you're in the middle of worry, this isn't super helpful. If I just tell you you've lost your focus. If, if you really want to get through anxiety, if you want to get through your fear, you need to get into the Word of God, and you need to talk to somebody. You need to get out of your own head. You need to have somebody tap you on the shoulder and say, don't let this define you, and don't let this ruin you. But when we're in the middle of fearful anxiety, when we're letting these these worries and concerns just roll over us, causing us to be ineffective and inactive, it, it takes our true focus away. We seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to us. The Lord will take care of all these other things. And so we focus ourselves on him, we focus ourselves on the work that we have to do, and we don't worry about all the things that might happen in this life. We trust in the Lord. We trust in him to take care of us. No matter if we die, we know there's a home prepared for us because he loved us enough to die for us. So sometimes anxiety can take away our excitement and our zeal. We can get so wrapped up in the fears of what might happen, the fears, and I can make a list of the fears, but I don't want to trigger anybody here. If, if I do list all the fears, I'm afraid you'll, I'll just lose you right here. So maybe after the lesson, think about some of the things you're afraid of after the lesson. We'll do that later. Well, let's, let's move on here. Maybe we'll squeeze the handle of selfishness. And, and for a really good lesson on this, just go back to the meeting that we had with Chris, taking myself out of the equation. That's really what this point is all about. Because what happens so often is we, we take our actions, the actions that we could be doing for others, the behaviors that we could be doing to support and serve others, and we make them all about ourselves. We turn everything into, oh me, oh I want to be happy, I want to be comfortable, and maybe we will say, I would rather be comfortable than get involved. I'd rather just focus on me, focus on myself, focus on being happy, than, than to get involved in the things that are going on. And that's so often when we have a goals meeting, the elders lay out things that they want for us all to get involved in. And maybe you'll say, I hope not, but maybe you'll say, I'd rather just, I'd rather just focus on myself. I'd rather just, just do the things that I want to do. And if we're so focused on ourselves, if we're so focused on our, our happiness and our comfort and our ease, do you think we're ever going to keep our, our zeal for the Lord going? It, it just won't happen. Because as we look to Jesus again, Jesus accomplished all of God's plan selflessly. Jesus was not focused on himself. Jesus was not focused on his happiness. If he were, his whole life would have looked very different than it actually was. Jesus was not focused on himself. He was focused on accomplishing the Lord's work. Selfishness is an attack on our behavior, and Jesus behaved and obeyed and acted on the Lord's behalf, not on his own. In his prayer, before his death in John 17, one of my favorite chapters. I love Jesus' prayer in John 17. And he starts it out by saying, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, 
having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. At the end of Jesus' life, he was able to say, I accomplished everything that God wanted me to do. I did everything that God gave me to do. And as we see him in the upper room washing his disciples' feet, the lesson he, he gives to them is, as I have done to you, now you go do for others. You go serve others. You go look out for the needs of other people. And isn't that exactly what we see in Jesus' entire life? He took moments alone to meditate. He took moments alone to pray. He took moments alone to decompress like we all need to. But so often he was in the middle of the crowd. So often he was there serving people, teaching people, bearing with people, having patience with people, confronting people. So often he was, he was doing things for other people and culminating in his death on the cross. The ultimate selfless act in which he was able to say, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. This was not about Jesus. This was not about him. This was all about the Father. There is nothing that can squash our faith, that can squash our zeal and our excitement than focusing on ourselves and not on God and not on what he wants us to do. And the reminder, I think, is, is that serving ourselves just leads us to ruin. Serving ourselves seems to feel good in the moment. Serving ourselves is just something that comes naturally to us. And given our default mode of operation, that's what we're going to do. We're going to serve ourselves. We're going to take care of number one. But as Jesus talks about in, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 to 27, a, a few very important pictures of how if you really want to be serving the Lord with confidence to know that you are going to receive a, a home in heaven in judgment, then you're going to do what the Lord says. You are going to bear good fruit for the Lord. You are going to do what the Lord tells you to do and then hear those words, welcome in, my faithful servant. You are like the wise man going to hear the words of Jesus and obey them, thus building your foundation on a strong and firm foundation. Ruin comes to those who trust in themselves and those who serve themselves. And just checking off a few boxes. I come to services, I wear nice clothes, I don't say bad words. We need to go further than that in everything we do. Monday through Saturday, every day of the week, not just Sundays, it's all about living for God, serving in the way God wants us to serve, being about our Father's business in this world, not our business. And the more we focus on ourselves, the more our flame of faith, the more our excitement and our zeal will dwindle to the point where it finally goes out. So the last point, let's, let's close this thing out. You can sweep side to side after you've done everything else with segregation. Segregation. This is an attack on our relationship. It's an attack on community. Because God doesn't want us to be alone. But if you want to squash your faith, the fire of your faith, faster than almost anything, just be alone. Feel alone. And maybe we'll say to ourselves, I'm all alone, and no one cares. Now, some of us like to be alone. I enjoy being alone. So this one steps on my toes. Every year, I find the opportunity around my birthday, I didn't get to this year, but every year I, I go off to a cabin for like five days and just to be alone. I love being alone, but I also am part of a community. I'm part of the community of the Lord's faithful. I'm part of this church. I'm also part of the community of the entire world in which I'm called to be a light, in which I'm called to go and teach others and bring them to an understanding of who Jesus is. I, I'm not segregated to an island. But if I try to do that, then my excitement for the Lord, my excitement for his plans and his purposes 
can go away pretty quickly. But you look to Jesus, and again, Jesus found himself alone. He, he found himself times to be quiet and by himself. But so often he was around people, so often he was serving people and doing everything he could to be an influence, a positive influence on others. But in John chapter 12, the culmination, again, of all of these things, and you'll notice, by the way, all these points about Jesus are about his, his death, are about what he accomplished in dying for us. Jesus exemplified a connection with people who most of the world wouldn't want to be around, eating with tax collectors and sinners and, and touching lepers and all the things that Jesus did to touch the lives of other people. But in his death, we see in John chapter 12, verse 27, as this hour is coming closer, he says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Dropping down to verse 31, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Who did Jesus die for? All people. He died for everyone. There's not a person you have ever met in your entire life that Jesus did not die for. Every single person in this room, every single person not in this room, Jesus died for them all. Which tells me that, that I'm part of a group of people who Jesus died for. Jesus didn't just die for me, though if I were the only one with sins, he would have died just for me. Jesus died for everyone. And as he is lifted up from the earth, he draws all people to himself. And so I need to be a part of the community. I need to welcome others as he has welcomed me. And we see this talked about so often in Romans chapter 15, a great chapter talking about unity and building unity, especially when difficulty and questions about judgment arise and, and liberties and things that, that we could easily let get in the way of our relationships together. Paul talks about how we should welcome one another how we should have harmony with one another, how we should seek peace and be united together. Nothing will turn a congregation's zeal for the Lord upside down and extinguish it faster than disunity and disharmony. We need to make sure that in 2021, no matter what our elders lay out before us, that we listen to them, that we follow their lead with excitement and zeal, and we find our role in the body to do what we can in helping this church grow. I guarantee you, when you start to see growth, when you start to see people growing in their discipleship, when you start to see them growing in their knowledge of God's word, in their heart, the way that they believe and the way that they are convicted, when you start to see the actions that they take, the good deeds, the good fruit that comes out of their life, that's motivating. And when they turn and help you increase in those things, that mutual love, that mutual concern for the Lord God, that fans the flame of faith. Notice in the, in the chapter that we started with, 2 Timothy chapter 1, it was Paul, the apostle, who was encouraging the young evangelist Timothy to fan the flame of faith within him. And notice who he refers to. Notice who he mentions there. His mom, his grandma, and him. Some very important people in Timothy's life. And we have important people around us here in this church. And we have very important people in the world outside of this church. That we need to be serving, that we need to be loving, that we need to be introducing to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have work to do. And it's people work. The work is all about the people. And I could be focusing on myself. I could be focusing on just pulling away and isolating myself. But that's not what Jesus wants. It's not what God wants for us to do. So hopefully we see in, in just a few of these things, these are areas and opportunities for us to pull away, for us to focus on ourselves, for us to, to take that flame of excitement and zeal and just let it dwindle into nothing. 
and sometimes actively take it and extinguish it ourselves. If you've ever found yourself doing any of these things, I'm right there with you. I've done these things before myself. I'm not perfect, and I know you've probably struggled with some of these things as well, and if you have, then hopefully 2021 is an opportunity for you to turn those around and be more aware of when you might be extinguishing your excitement for the Lord. And I'm not just saying we all need to have our heads in the sand like Pollyanna, ignoring all the bad stuff that's happening. 2021 hasn't exactly turned around, you know, 180 degrees from 2020 yet. But no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, let's stay excited for the Lord. Let's stay excited for His purposes. Our, our little kids know that song so well. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan get out. And I guess that's my encouragement for you. Don't let Satan get out. Because he wants to. He wants to take our excitement away. He wants us to become lukewarm. He wants us to just drift away and not be on fire for God. And I want you to be on fire for God. I want you to fan the flame of faith within you. So think about these things, and I hope this has been an encouragement for you. Go ahead and take out your songbooks. Turn to the number that's been announced. If, you, if you've let that flame of faith die down, and you're ready to, to get back on the path, you need the prayers of this group for help doing that. We're here to pray for you. We're here to, to walk alongside you and help you in whatever ways that we can. If you're not a child of his, though, there's a spark maybe that's, that's lit within your heart. Maybe that spark has started to take hold. Maybe you're starting to, to understand what it is you need to do. That spark started in, a, in the few hearts of, of some recently in our number who decided to come to the Lord, decided to give themselves to, to the Lord. And maybe if you're wondering about that spark in your own heart, go talk to some of those people and ask them, why did you decide to give your life to the Lord? You can ask any one of us. Maybe they're, they're a good place to start. If we can help you, along that journey, if we can help baptize you this morning to get you into that family of the saved, then won't you come as we stand and sing? Have you a heart?